Hello, Booktube, from the uh, soot and brick dust laden war zone that was once peaceful, leafy, idyllic Hyde Cottage. I come to you once again to make Booktube videos in the midst of hammering and chaos. I'm hoping that no sounds other than maybe the whirring of the air conditioner unit uh, are audible in this in this video. I've heard pretty good reports from most of you about how that's that's not a problem. That's good uh, because I think this filming location, this filming arrangement is probably the law of the land uh, for the foreseeable future. Every estimate that I have had of when this work is going to be done has been wildly, obviously fraudulent. <laughs> so I am now operating under the classic uh, Boston Irish Catholic approach that it's never going to be finished, that it's just never going to happen, that it's going to be, there's going to be work, I'm going to con be confined to this room for the rest of my days. Uh, but life goes on. <laughs> and not only does I do I get work done? Tons and tons of reading done. Not only is there a pathway so that I can take the little bean out on walks. Uh, we had a couple of wonderful walks today. Today is the last day of this week that is uh, beautiful, temperate, normal summer weather, uh, where the, the temperature goes up to 80 or 81 degrees Fahrenheit during the height of the day and then slopes right back down and there's low humidity. Uh, those are wonderful days to walk around in. It's it's still possible for a, a little dog with tight, wiry fur to overheat. So I still have to keep an eye on the bean, but they have been just gorgeous days to walk around. And the walks have been wonderful, too. Nice and relaxed, plenty of people for Frida to accost uh, and scream at. She screams at strangers to pet her. And if they give her a little pet on the head and, say, and then go back to talking about whatever they were talking about, she screams at them extra loud and extra long, a long, sustained, Maria Callas-style note, to let them know that she will tell them when to stop petting her. It's not their decision. It's hers. <laughs> Fortunately, that goes over really well, because she's an incredibly cute little dog. Uh, you don't have her in these videos. You have a craft work version of her. But one of the things that goes on, in addition to the, the writing and the reading and the dog walks, is mail. Mail keeps coming uh, to the place. Yesterday, big pile of books came, uh, and they never got out of their packages. Those, those packages were just piled into a smelting pot and made into spackle for the west wall. Uh, so I'll never know what those books were. They'll be a part of this building forever. Uh, but I managed to save a couple of packages today and a periodical. The periodical is uh, The New Yorker. It's their July the 4th issue. It has a cover by Chris Ware, and I suppose the cover is brilliant. But boy, I don't like it. Uh, I suppose that is brilliant. We have two people in, you know, it's a row of houses, so they're, they're the same building. But it's supposed to show the divide in America, where one... One person has a red hat, the symbol for American fascism, uh, and the other person has a little free library and a Black Lives Matter sign, and they're in a hammock, not a chair, and whatnot. And I would argue uh, that this dichotomy, the dichotomy captured, I admit, so effectively on this cover, uh, you see you've even got the red and the blue coloring to show the dividing line between the two parts of America. I would argue that this dividing line, this the, the thing that this cover shows... Uh, is in many ways fraudulent itself, in many ways wrong. Uh, especially the implication that it gives that these are two valid ways to look at the world. And it's just, you know, neighbors don't agree. You've got Democrat versus Republican. I'm sure that there are people who looked at this New Yorker cover and thought, well, you know, 70 years ago, you could have had a cover just like this for the New Yorker. I'm sure there were some. Uh, and 70 years ago, there were two competing political opinions. Two, politi two competing political philosophies, and it's possible the two neighbors could have been split right down the middle on those philosophies. That is not this. That is not what that red hat symbolizes. That red hat has nothing to do with politics. So these are not equal. It shouldn't be considered that way. But <laughs> that's, that's a rant for another day. Or perhaps never. <laughs> but the issue had a couple of really good things in it. I want to just r rattle them off here. Uh, where were they? This, the fiction was terrible. The poems were terrible. Uh, David Remnick's piece was terrible, which is odd. Uh, oh, right. Here it is. Uh, Andy Pruel has a book on swamps uh, in America. The, there was, there's an article by Andrew Morantz, Mar uh, The Illiberal Order, that was infuriating. Infuriating. It was as bad as that piece that we encountered, a, what was it, weeks ago? 
time loses all meaning when you don't have walls. Uh, that that sort of tongue-in-cheek, wow, these people are a little wacky, first-hand gonzo reporting at CPAC. And this this article is about Viktor Orban, but it, it uh, very much starts and stops with exactly the same thing. This writer went to the same CPAC, saw the same lunatics, overheard the same insane, seditious conversations, and writes about it in the exact same pinky-in-the-air, po-faced way. Like... Like, for all the world, like both writers of both pieces think that when the revolution comes, the other side will appreciate their elegant cut glass humor. They will be lined against a wall and shot. And it won't matter that they pulled their punches in describing what it was they saw. That won't matter at all. <laughs> the, the, the America, the, the order that is coming, hates any kind of organized rational thought. So I don't know what kind of momentary compensation it will be for what's his name again andrew morantz to know that the the person next to him on the firing line is ben shapiro they'll both be killed uh but <laughs> but the uh the annie pruel piece uh had a couple of really good bits in it that i wanted to make sure that i shared uh one is this this little paragraph here it is important it is an important decision to restore even a small piece of wetland that has been severely mauled the piece is about american wetlands american swamps and the, the incredible assault that they are under from all sides. An assault that has been made immeasurably easier today because the alt-right Republican Supreme Court ruled that the EPA has no authority over environmental protection <laughs> and, and essentially defang them. So the few tiny, stubbornly remnant holders on of wetlands, tidal marshes, that sort of thing, will be gone before anything can be done about that ruling. In fact, nothing can be done about that ruling. Um, so this piece had an extra poignancy that it didn't have when Annie Poor wrote it. When she wrote it, those those wetlands were still largely federally protected. The, fe the, the alt-right Supreme Court has just come out and said, eh, not so much. The EPA can issue warnings, but it can't do much else. Uh, so I've seen wetlands. I've trekked through them. Uh, some of you probably have as well, but your grandchildren will not. Not in America. Uh, but this is this, this this paragraph starts off with it is an important decision to restore even a small piece of wetland that has been severely mauled. Once land is apportioned to owners, there can be no easy path to restoration of a natural habitat. Bogs and swamps take thousands of years to build up and develop. Humans and their machinery can wipe out those centuries in a few months. Uh, but once a few interested people put on their boots and go into the damaged wetland, and once their curiosity is aroused by how the water moves and what plants, amphibians, birds formerly thrived in their local remnant swamp, they are hard to stop. There is unequal joy in restoration. That is, that is lovely, that is very well put, but those people with their boots and their good intentions are easy to stop. Guns will stop them, uh, and guns will now be positioned to stop them. Uh, but the piece is called Swamped, and it starts off this way, which is really neat. Uh, it can be hell finding one's way across an extensive boggy moor. The partially dry, rough ground and the absence of any landmarks let the eye rove helplessly into the, mon the monotype distance. Everything undulates. The rise and fall share the same muted palette and the sense is dull. But a swamp is different. In it, in addition to water, there are trees and shrubs just as reeds and rushes are the hallmark of a marsh. Although water and squelch are everywhere in a swamp, there are landmarks. Downed trees or jagged stumps, a tenanted heroin nest, an occasional islands that uh, of high ground hardwood stands called hammocks in the south. Yet the swamp traveler goes not in a straight line, but slouches from quaking island to quick tussock to slippery, half-submerged log. Even with GPS technology, big swamps are places to get lost. And in the past, many people with a right, with a reason to melt out of sight, Native Americans threatened out of their territory, runaway slaves, Civil War army deserters, moonshiners, and bloody-handed murderers have hidden in them. For a few seconds, I once considered hiding in a swamp myself. <laughs> Tell me that isn't an inviting opening for a, for a piece. Uh, it was very, very good. I don't think that it's part of any kind of larger book. I think I might still save it anyway, but it will be with a pang of sadness. Especially after, I mean, it's just coincidence that I happen to get this issue today when this, this alt-right Supreme Court, this fascist Supreme Court, has been issuing one uh, just horrible revanchist opinion after another all week long 
opinions that fly in the face of 70, 80, 90 percent of polled Americans. Doesn't matter. They can do it and no one can stop them. Uh, and they're all Republican. It's a Republican supermajority. It's an intensely political body. The Republicans have completely shattered the idea that the judiciary is independent of politics. Some people might have still been clinging to that idea. That idea is now completely gone. And Americans know it. Faith, trust, esteem for the Supreme Court is polling lower than it ever has been. And the court is laughing. That supermajority is laughing about those polls. They see them. And they're laughing about it because there's nothing that can be done. Except to, to expand the court. And then fast track local cases in the appellate divisions up to the Supreme Court in order to reverse these things, in order to reverse these rulings. That's how you have to do it. You get somebody to get a case going in a lower court, and you get it up the ranks to the Supreme Court with 13 judges, seven of whom are not fascists. And there's no likelihood that that will ever happen. That, in fact, will never happen. Uh, so it was just coincidence. It's a, a rant-ready coincidence. I'll stop the ranting now. And we'll move on to the packages. We've got a couple of packages today. Uh, let's see what we have here. One of them has a piece of paperwork in it. That's not good. The paperwork is almost certainly some sort of invoice, and uh, we don't cotton to invoices around these parts. Yes, it is. Gross. Uh, but there is also a book, a finished copy. That's good. This has been a very, very good uh, week for mail, for books. A very good week for work, a very good week for dealing with editors and publicists. You know, it would be it'd be the height of of querulous old guy to import these house construction worries into that outside world. That outside world doesn't know that my my home is under siege. They have no idea that that's true. So why not put a happy face on things, right? There are holes in the walls already, holes in the ceilings already. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm not a trained carpenter. I'm beginning to suspect that I'm not paying trained carpenters either. But they're the only ones who can fix the mess that they've made, and I can't fix that timetable at all. So, you know, it's a it's a key lesson of life, you know? Don't let angering irritations that you can't control at all preoccupy you. I ought to be taking that advice myself when it comes to thinking about the rulings of this fascist Supreme Court. Uh, but anyway, what if we... Oh, right, okay, okay. All right, this one has an interesting origin story. This is Matt Johnson's book, Invisible Things. And I didn't know about it, except for social media. Isn't that a 21st century thing to say? The author did an, a wonderfully awkward book announcement video that he put on Twitter, and I happened to see it. Uh, and it, it was wonderfully, self-consciously awkward and very funny. And I left a comment to that effect on it. I comment liberally on Twitter. I left a comment saying that this did make me chuckle, but damn it, I'm an author. I'm not supposed to like... I'm, I'm a critic. I'm not supposed to like authors... And his publicist, bless her heart, she swooped in immediately <laughs> and offered to send me a copy. Well, I'll get our reviews. So let's see what this thing is. We'll see. Uh, Matt Johnson is one of the great comic writers of our time. That's how the pub sheet starts. <laughs> oh, my. Known for his sharp-eyed and hilarious novels that cross genres to shine a light on race, class, politics, and family. His last two novels, Pym and Loving Day, were New York Times notables and cult favorites. Okay. Uh, and in this book, which is his first novel in seven years, good lord, uh, this book asks the question, to what lengths will some people go to cope with a reality so absurd it defies reason entirely? Start a booktube channel. Uh, the story takes readers to New Roanoke, an entire city encased in a bubble on Europa, one of Jupiter's largest moons, hence the, the cover, I would imagine, and populated entirely by alien abductees. Okay. This sounds great so far, but whoever wrote this pub sheet was literally one second away from knowing whether or not Europa is not just one of, but Jupiter's largest moon. Is it or isn't it? Jupiter has a moon that is its largest moon. Is that moon Europa? That would take you literally five seconds to find out. And instead, it's weasel phrase. I'm assuming the publicist was very busy and couldn't spare those five seconds. I remember once upon a time when it would have been five minutes. Because it would have been a physical reference book. You would have had to get up from your desk at your in your office and go down the hall to the library. 
once upon a time, who is this? One World Publishing, whoever their parent company is, would have had a library on the premises. I'm old enough to remember when newspapers had libraries on the premises. And you would have to get, in the pre-internet days, you would have to get up, go to that library, find out what is Jupiter's largest moon, and then double check it with a different book to make sure it's right. Either that or you could take the lazy way out and call the New York Public Library. And there would be, instead of an obnoxious automated call park, there would be a librarian who would answer the phone. It wouldn't be a Simpsons-style call park. If you know the name of the crime being committed, press 1. <laughs> You've selected regicide. If you know the name of the king or queen being murdered, press 2. <laughs> it would be a librarian, and you could simply ask them, what's Jupiter's largest moon? And then, are you sure? Uh, but not so with this publicist. They could have done this immediately. But anyway, <laughs> so let's just move on. Uh, so this, the dome city on Europa is, pub is populated entirely by people who've been abducted by aliens. That's kind of clever. For those in power, New Roanoke is a utopia. It's a utopia with a singularly ill-omened name. <laughs> uh, but for the rest of the population, it's a city defined by wealth inequality and governed by a predatory elite with an, econo with an economy built on heedless consumption. And it happens to be terrorized by an invis invisible entity so disturbing that no one even dares acknowledge its existence. Why not? Well, as one character put it, because even acknowledging the problem would be tantamount to admitting their dream about the nature of this place is delusional. And then the pub she's asked if that sounds familiar. Uh, so, oh wait, here, don't. Let's not, let's not get rid of this until we see what we're dealing with here. This uh, came out a couple of days ago. So this is out already. I will read this tonight. Uh, and there's no, I mean, this would be, I would be viewing this for Open Letters Review. Uh, which I've been doing a lot of reviewing at Open Letters Review, and I have to I have to thank a lot of you for that. Uh, I mean, Open Letters Review, for those of you who are new to the channel, is the online literary journal where I am uh, one of the editors. And as a result, I don't have to jump through hoops at Open Letters Review in order to determine what I will review, when I will review it, how I will review it, how long that review will be. I don't have to do any of that. You do, if you want to write for Open Letters Review, and I strongly urge you to. My hoops are very gentle, <laughs> but I don't. Uh, so I, this will be for that. Obviously, if it's get if the finished copy is getting to me two days after its pub date, I can't interest any editor in it. But I'm perfectly free to review it. Or to, I'll be reviewing a few June books in early July, and I, I write for Open Letters Review all the time. I wrote for its predecessor, Open Letters Monthly, all the time. But I have to admit, there's been an extra an extra uh, kick in the step lately because I've received over the last month or two a strange uptick in those of you out there and though in you writing to me specifically to say you really enjoy my written book reviews. That they're well done, funny, different from other book reviews, less politic, far more uh, honest, straightforward. Uh, I've had all sorts of compliments about my writing. And, you know, I don't want you to take that wrong because I put a lot of work into my writing. I make it look easy because I'm, I'm incredibly fast. And I do it all the time. I do a huge amount of it. I'm not one of these people who's chin stroking and pondering for a month before he writes a review. But it, I take a lot of pride in it myself. But I, I perfectly know the danger I run by being the Virginia Creeper of the literary world. I write so much that no one really thinks about it at all. My reviews are used, consulted in many places, but no one thinks about the thing they're actually reading. Very few people, until these last couple of months, have taken the trouble to say to me, well, you know, in addition to being useful, I wanted to know, I was never going to get around this book, haven't seen a review of it anywhere else. It was also a really good review. I, I was enjoyable to read. You always say that book reviews are a kind of writing on their own and should be enjoyable for the reader as something quite apart from a Yelp rating of the book. And boy, oh boy, you do it. I don't know all of every reviewer does, but you do. And that has turned my head in <laughs> quite a way. It's given, me, it's given me an extra kick in my step to just keep writing open letters reviews. They're real. They're as real as anything else. They go out into the world. They get blurbed on books. Um, so I, I want to thank you for that. It's, it's, it's very nice. I know that my Deb always jokes, you know, don't, don't compliment him. It only makes him worse. But it's nice to hear. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the, just a long digression to say this is out already in your bookstores. If that description sounded interesting to you, you should go on Twitter and find this author. You'll be able to find his little book announcement video. You'll see what I mean. You'll chuckle too. Uh, the only problem with this book, I don't know, I haven't, haven't read a single page of it, don't know anything about it. I learned about it just a couple of days ago. The only problem that I can see here uh, will be evident to you too. Uh, this is 
a satire about current conditions. And that would be fine in any other era but the 21st century era of Twitter politics, where satire is only possible if, if you can have a little bit of even dark gallows humor at the expense of the things that are outraging you. And in the 21st century, humor is increasingly in danger. Uh, it will be, you'll be running a risk of health, of, of threats to your health and your children's health uh, after November. To be sarcastic about anything that's not on an approved list, you can be sarcastic as you want about woke politics, but you can't be sarcastic about anything else. I think we all know what the unspoken menace looming over this new Roanoke is. It has a name, and it has fake hair and orange skin. Uh, and after 2024, it, it won't just be threats to your health or ominous warnings thrown through your window. It will be much worse than that. So we live in, we're living in the end times of this kind of political satire, and the author is not old. Does he have a picture here? Oh, well, he's, he's got gray hair. Uh, and he's, he's a department chair at the University of Oregon. Okay, so he is maybe old enough to remember when this could be done. He might remember Watergate. He might have been a child during Watergate. So maybe he can manage it, is what I'm saying. I, if, it were, if it were a younger person with pronouns in their bio, I would worry that the people, younger people cannot do satire. Younger writers, they don't even understand what it is. Because as far as they're concerned, they're on uh, jihad every day. Get up, get out of bed, decide your gender, and then go on a jihad for that day. Because you are Rosa Banks, you're Rosa Parks. You have been beaten, clubbed, sprayed, attacked by police dogs just yesterday. Now, it didn't happen. You've lived a completely privileged, comfortable life your whole life. But nevertheless, thousands and thousands of people, the all-knowing among us, the young among us, start every day by thinking it's another day in the trenches. It's another day struggling for my very existence. All I want is the right to live. All I want is for you not to kill me. Uh, <laughs> in a mind frame like that, there, it is barren ground for satire to take root. It cannot happen. Uh, so we shall see. I, I, you know, that peroration that I did <laughs> increases my own interest in seeing how the book turns out. I'll read it. I'll read it tonight. Uh, and probably I'll read this next one tonight as well. We'll uh, an awful ranty mail on last night. Well, we've only got one more to go, and then we'll finish up. Uh, oh no, maybe I won't read this one tonight because this is this is a bound galley. These are bound pages. So this is probably well in the future. This is this is probably nowhere near pub date. What is the pub date on this thing? Mid September. Uh, when I I well work will still be going on here. I won't have an apartment still. I'll still be filming from this little corner. Uh, but mid-September is a long way off. Two months. That's so. This is uh, the new book by Robert Harris. So a lot of you will be interested in that right off the bat, right? He's a known quantity. I'm sure that for a lot of you, he's the same as me. What I always refer to on this channel is his credit at the Bank of Steve. What I mean by that is how many times has an author pleased you? It, this isn't a crapshoot, right? This isn't, a, this isn't pulling cards out of the deck. If an author pleases you three times in a row, it's because they know what they're doing. Almost certainly it's because they know what they're doing. It's not random chance anymore. And Robert Harris has pleased me almost every time at bat. I can only think of one book of his that I didn't like. Uh, and this is his new one. This is, this is uh, Act of Oblivion, the new book by Robert Harris, uh, who wrote uh, a book that's actually in this room, Pompeii. His novel Pompeii is somewhere in this room. I'm tempted to see if it's within reach, but we had a catastrophe the other day when I tried to grab something. Uh, you're going to love the description of this, though, and it's going to strike you as familiar, because just it struck me as familiar because just the other day we had an indie book come here uh, on the exact same subject. <laughs> this is, you know, that indie book. Be lucky if it sells 20 copies. Uh, it's called A Trader in the Family, I think. Uh, I, I keep meaning to post it on social media, hype it up. I read it. It's actually very, very good. Uh, and it was written by the great, great, however many great granddaughter of one of the executioners of King Charles the uh, First, who fled, and and this this uh, this indie author traces all of those generations to tell their stories. And this book, Act of Oblivion, is also about those ex those those traitors, the people who beheaded the king. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this book is a spellbinding historical thriller that brilliantly imagines one of the greatest forgotten manhunts in history, the search for two English renegades involved in the killing of King Charles I and the implacable foe on their trail through the wilds of 17th century New England. 
Uh, and this was, there were a couple of popular histories about this. One of them was uh, by Lord Spencer, uh, the uh, Killers of the King. Uh, there were a couple of popular histories about these, about this manhunt, about the fact that uh, that a few of the the guilty people fled to the New World and had to be hunted here because Charles II issued the so-called Act of Oblivion, saying all the people who were involved in my father's execution must be killed themselves; they must be hunted down and killed. Uh, let's see here. This book is Harris's first historical novel set predominantly in America, and a chase like no other. It marries an urgent narrative with remarkable characters and an epic true story to tell of religion, vengeance, and power. Okay, so it comes out in September, so I won't be getting to it tonight. I will get to uh, to Invisible Things tonight. Uh, but put it on your radar. Those of you who read this author know already that you like him. He, he, he knows what he's doing. Uh, this will be a fascinating subject to me. I wonder... I, I wonder if he's available for an interview. That would be a lot of fun to see what kind of research he did about 17th century New England, <laughs> which is when I went to school. <laughs> so those are our books for today. Two novels. Uh, no nonfiction. We have two novels and uh, The New Yorker, with, I admit, uh, a classic New Yorker cover. But New Yorker covers are meant to, they're, they're meant to be uh, simple. They're meant to not be busy. Uh, they're meant to convey a very pointed message immediately. I just, there are aspects of this message I don't completely agree with, but that is a pure New Yorker cover. And considering some of the ugly things we see, I'm happy about that. So that is the mail for today. Uh, and more mail will come tomorrow. I will do my best to make sure that it is not warped into the compost heap or the spackle jar or anything like that. I'll try to save it so that we can have some sort of a mail haul tomorrow night when most of the work has quieted down. God knows when I'll see the workers again. Tomorrow night is the last night before a long weekend, a holiday weekend, a big holiday weekend here in the United States, the 4th of July. Pretty tough to celebrate the 4th of July, unironically, this year, especially after this last two weeks, with a, an out-of-control, alt-right fascist Supreme Court altering the tenor of American life permanently for hundreds of millions of people. Pretty tough to, to put all that aside, but... Uh, for the last five years, I have been using the 4th of July. 4th of July means a lot to me. It's one of the two holidays in the calendar that mean a lot to me. And for the last few years, I have been putting everything aside and just using it, uh, looking at the day commemoratively. It's a commemorative day. It's, it's a day when I remember. The American experiment lasted for almost 250 years. That's a long, long time, and a lot of good came from it. Uh, my workers... Who knows how long they will last tomorrow with that kind of a goal in mind? <laughs> with that kind of a goal in mind, I don't expect to see them after two. And it's going to be a hot day tomorrow. Today was the last of the temperate hot weather. Tomorrow we get a skyrocketing increase in heat and humidity ahead of some stormy weather. One day, certainly nothing to complain about. There are huge parts of the country that have been baking in triple digit heat for a long time. Tomorrow will be prohibitively hot for a long dog walks, even slow-paced dog walks around the neighborhood. It'll be prohibitive. The pavement itself will be hot for my little beans, tiny little feet. Uh, and then there'll be probably stormy weather, and then everything washes out, and the temperatures go right back into the 70s and low 80s Fahrenheit. So nothing to complain about. Uh, the videos will continue. I am determined to keep talking to my imaginary book two friends. It'll keep me sane, or at least as close to sane as I can get. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this video up and talk to you a few more. I'll make a few more videos before I, tell, I curl it in for the night. Uh, so I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you.